You'll hear two teachers discussing a school trip. First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 6. Now listen carefully and answer questions 1 to 6. Oh, there you are, Paul. Do you have a few minutes? Can we think about this year's school trip? Hi, Jean. Yes, of course. Have you got any ideas? I've been looking through some information, and I've brought a few leaflets with me. Here you are. Okay, thanks. Just remind me when the trip is. Next Friday. We'll be leaving at 9 and be back here at around 4, so we've probably got time to visit a couple of places. Let's see. What leaflet have you got there? Central Gardens. Looks like a nice place. It's open from 9 until 6, so we could go there any time we wanted, really. What about there in the morning and then somewhere else in the afternoon? Farmer's Market would be an option first as well, at least until they close at 1. Or we could try Grey Castle. That should be possible in the morning or in the afternoon. Oh, hang on. That's at the weekend. The last admission is at noon on weekdays. Greenhall says the same thing. Queen's Park opens at 8, so we could go there first. Or, according to these times, we could go there on the way back to school. Because they don't close the gates until sunset during the week. Okay, that gives us a few options. We went to Queen's Park a couple of years ago, didn't we? I seem to remember that the pupils really enjoyed it. It'd be nice to go somewhere new as well. I've seen groups from other schools going around Grey Castle. So have I. But then again, maybe we should play it safe and go to Green Hall. At least we've got experience of taking classes around there. Farmer's Market is popular with other schools, though, so it must be interesting. It'd be good to go somewhere where someone can show the pupils around, you know, explain things to them. I've been on a tour around the castle, and they do a really good job. I think they have guides at the hall, too, don't they? It says here that they used to, but don't anymore. You can get shown around Central Gardens, though. I think we'd have to do any explaining if we took the pupils to the market or the park. That wouldn't be a problem, though. No, and at least those two would be free, wouldn't they? I think all the others charge, and we'd have to get the parents to pay some money. I'm sure they wouldn't mind paying if it was a small amount. Let me check the leaflets. There's a special price for large groups at Grey Castle. Oh, but you can get into Central Gardens for nothing. Right. Oh, I've just thought of something. We wouldn't need to book anything if we were going to Queen's Park. But what about the other places? Uh, Central Gardens say you need to let them know if there are more than ten people in your group, which would include us. The same at Grey Castle. Farmer's Market says you can just turn up, and so does Green Hall. Right. Well, I suggest we take the pupils to Grey Castle for a tour in the morning. How does that sound? Yes, sounds good. We should contact them to book it as soon as possible. In the afternoon, we can do something a bit more relaxed at the park, and we'll have to think about going to Green Hall another year. Shame Farmer's Market isn't open, but we can't change the day. So that's a decision then. Now, let's think about what we're going to get the pupils to do. It's a school trip, after all, and we should give them some work to do. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 7 to 10.
Now listen and answer questions 7 to 10. I think they should know something about the place before they go. That way they know what they're looking at, and they'll be able to write about it better when they get back. I'll put some information together to look at at home and give them copies after the next lesson. Good idea. I'll write something for them to do as they're going round the place. We did a quiz last year, and that worked really well. I'll do the same kind of thing this time. Okay. Now, what about the travel arrangements? How are we getting there? What do you think? I remember one year Mrs. Jackson took her group by bus, and that was a complete nightmare. Hmm. It's quite a long way, isn't it? We could hire a coach for the day, which is what we usually do. Or there's the train. It's rush hour, though, isn't it? So it'll be really crowded. And it'll be more convenient for the rest of the day if we've got our own transport. Yes, we'll do that then. Anything else? Oh, we need to let the parents know what's happening. We could ask the office to call everyone. It would take too long with so many. I know when we send a letter home, there are always a few pupils who lose it. But not all the parents have email yet, so I don't think we have any choice, really. I'll write something and take it to the school office this afternoon. Right. I'll go and tell the pupils the good news. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Section 2. You are going to hear a radio program about sport. First, look at questions 11 to 14. For these questions, listen carefully and circle the correct letters. And now for our Mystery Personality of the Week and your chance to win one of our fabulous prizes. Last week's competition generated a huge response and the first five answers pulled out of the bag will receive a hundred pounds worth of sports clothes vouchers. And if you didn't win last week, here's another chance. And this week's prize is even bigger. We're giving away 10 prizes of £250 worth of book, music and clothes vouchers to mark the first anniversary of the show on the air. So get your pens ready to take down the address details. Just write the name of the person you think is our mystery personality and send it to Mystery Draw at the address Marcia will give you in just a second. The address will be repeated at the end of the show for those of you who didn't get it. And so it's over to Marcia, who will tell you a few tantalising details about our mystery person this week. Thanks, Mike. Well, here goes. Our mystery person this week is a very well-known footballer who plays for a famous club and has also played for his national team. He is very talented and is enormously popular especially for the part he played in a famous footballing victory. And two clues. He hasn't got a famous wife, and he speaks French. If you think you know who it is, then pop the answer on a postcard and send it to Mystery Draw, P.O. Box 5110, London SE1 5LE. That's P.O. Box 5110. And please don't forget to write your name and address too. And now it's back to Mike. Before the broadcast continues, 
Look at questions 15 to 20. As you listen to the second part of the sports programme, answer questions 15 to 20. For questions 15 to 19, write no more than two words or a number for each answer. For question 20, circle the correct letter. Thank you, Marcia. Get those postcards in and make this a bumper anniversary draw. Now, if you remember, last week on the show, we talked to the organiser of a new group set up to help young people up to the age of 20 to get involved in activities like horse riding, tennis, scuba diving, cycling, or any form of sport which involves some kind of expense. John Tebbit, the organiser, rang us to say that the response to his appeal on the show was staggering. A large number of people, both young and old, have offered their services free as volunteers. The whole thing has been overwhelming. John said that they had also had numerous offers of help throughout the country to use facilities free of charge. As if that was not enough, they've received many donations, including several rather large gifts of more than £5,000. On behalf of John Tebbit, and also of those who will benefit from the generous gifts to the Trust, I would like to say thank you. This week, we're going to talk to a very unusual athlete indeed. Patrick, who is 20 years of age, has been wheelchair-bound for the past five years after a motorcycle accident left him paralysed from the waist down. This has not stopped this young man from getting out and about. He's an inspiration to all of us. Patrick has excelled in archery, beating the best in the field, so much so that he has won sponsorship from leading sports manufacturers, which has now enabled him to devote more time to perfecting his skills. So I would like to introduce you to Patrick, who is going to tell us what this sponsorship means to him. That's the end of Section 2. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Part 3 In this section, you will hear a discussion between three people in a university tutorial. In the first part of the discussion, they're talking about city traffic and the motor car. First, look at questions 21 to 24. Now listen to the first part of the discussion and answer questions 21 to 24. We're very pleased to welcome Professor Isaac Nebworth to our tutorial group today. And he's come to share one of his pet passions with us, city traffic and our Western dependence on the motor car. I believe questions are quite welcome throughout. Thank you. Well, I know you're all very familiar with the superhighway here in Melbourne. But do superhighways automatically lead to super wealth, as our politicians would have us believe? I think not. Can you give us an example of what you mean exactly? Sure. 
Well, by continuing to encourage this dependence on the motor car, we simply create more congestion and more urban sprawl. And you can see that here in Melbourne, right under your nose. Excuse me, I would just like to say that I feel the sprawl is part of the city. The freeways mean people can enjoy the benefits of living away from the centre on larger blocks with gardens, but still be able to drive back into the city centre for work or entertainment. Well, I'm not convinced that people want to do that. And is our money being well spent? It may be okay for you now, but come back to me in five years' time. Let's take City Link, for example, the new freeway here in Melbourne. Well, I use the freeway all the time. I think it's great. Ah, yes, but it cost two billion dollars to build, and you could have gotten ten times the value by putting the money into public transport. If you give the automobile road space, it will fill that space, and you'll soon find you'll be crawling along your city link. But surely you cannot simply blame the car. Some of the blame must rest with governments and city planners. Well, there is an argument, surely, that building good roads is actually beneficial because most new cars these days are highly efficient. They use far less petrol than in the past, and emissions of dangerous gases are low. Old congested roads, on the other hand, encourage traffic to move slowly, and it's the stationary cars that cause the pollution and smog. Whereas good roads increase traffic speeds, and thus the amount of time cars are actually on the roads. Well, this is the old argument put forward by the road lobby, but for me it's clear cut: roads equal cars, which equal smog. Public transport is the way to go. In the second part of the discussion, the professor talks about public transport in different cities. Look at questions twenty-five to thirty first. As you listen to the discussion, complete the questions about public transport. Now, on that topic of public transport, I read somewhere recently that Australia isn't doing too badly in the challenge to increase the use of public transport. Better than America, granted, but by comparison with Canada, it's not so good. For instance, if you compare Toronto with the U.S. metropolis of Detroit, only 160 kilometers away. In Detroit, only one percent of passenger travel is by public transport, whereas in Toronto it's twenty-four percent, which is considerably better than Sydney, which can only boast sixteen percent. Well, I think it's encouraging that our least car-dependent city is actually our largest city. Sixteen percent of trips being taken on public transport in Sydney isn't too bad. But it's a long way behind Europe. Take both London and Paris, for instance, where 30 percent of all trips taken are on public transport. Well, they do both have an excellent underground system. And Frankfurt comes in higher still at 32 percent. I understand that they've been very successful in Copenhagen at ridding the city of the car. Can you tell us anything about that experiment? Yes, indeed. Copenhagen is a wonderful example of a city that has learned to live without the motor car. Back in the 1960s, they adopted a number of policies designed to draw people back into the city. For instance, they paid musicians and artists to perform in the streets. They also built cycle lanes, and now 30 percent of the inhabitants of Copenhagen use a bicycle to go to work. Sydney, by comparison, can only boast one percent of the population cycling to work. It could have something to do with all the hills. Then they banned cars from many parts of the city, and every year three percent of the city parking is removed. And by constantly reducing parking, they've created public spaces and clean air. Really? There are also freely available bicycles, which you can hire for practically nothing. And of course, they have an excellent public transport system. Well, that's all very well for Copenhagen, but I'd just like to say that some cities are just too large for a decent public transport system to work well, particularly in areas with low population. 
because if there aren't many people using the service, then they don't schedule enough buses or trains for that route. I accept that there is a vicious circle here, but people do need to support the system. And secondly, the whole process takes so long because usually you have to change. You know, from bus to train, that sort of thing. And that can be quite difficult. Ultimately, it's much easier to jump in your car. And often, it turns out to be cheaper. Sure, but cheaper for whom? You or society? We have to work towards the ideal and not give in all the time because things are too difficult. Anyway, let's move on to some of the results of the survey, which I think you'll agree. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Section 4. You will hear a talk on research in the Indian Ocean. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40. Now listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. In this, the first lecture in our series on the changing face of the oceans of the world, we are going to look at the Indian Ocean, into which the Oceanography Department at the Institute here in Australia has been doing pioneering research over the past five years. Let us start with some facts about the Indian Ocean, to give you an idea of the scope and complexity of the enterprise we have undertaken. As you can see from the diagrams here on the screen, showing the relative size of the planet's five oceans, the Indian Ocean comes third after the Pacific and Atlantic Oceans, but is larger than the Southern Ocean and the Arctic Ocean. On this slide, you can see that the Indian Ocean is different from the two larger oceans in that it is landlocked to the north and does not extend into the cold regions of the North Pole, covering some 73,440,000 square kilometres. The ocean constitutes approximately one seventh of the Earth's surface and about 20 percent of the world's total ocean area. At the equator. It is around 6,400 kilometres wide, with the average depth being about 3,400 metres, and with the deepest point being the Java Trench at 7,450 metres. Flowing into the Indian Ocean, we have some of the world's greatest rivers. The Zambezi here, the Ganges here, the Indus, the Brahmaputra, and the Tigris-Euphrates just here. The two largest islands in the Indian Ocean, Madagascar, here off the coast of Africa, and Sri Lanka, here off the southern tip of India, are structurally parts of the continents of Africa and Asia, while islands like the Seychelles are exposed tops of submerged ridges. The Maldives are low coral islands, and Mauritius and Réunion are volcanic cones. The surface waters of the ocean are warm, except where the ocean touches the cold waters to the south. A network of scientists, mainly oceanographers and meteorologists from around the world, 
are monitoring changes in the ocean's temperature and acidity, especially where it meets the Southern Ocean, in order to see how global warming is having an effect on the waters there. An assessment is also being carried out on how this is impacting on low-lying habitats and peoples in the more populated coastal regions around the rim of the ocean. In the warmer north, islands are vulnerable to even the subtlest changes in sea levels and tides, so they are being closely watched. Moreover, a close eye is being kept on wind changes, especially alterations to the monsoon rains, typhoons, cyclones, and any other natural phenomena. In addition to the information sent from the ship that we have stationed off Antarctica, in the south of the Indian Ocean, data are being transmitted round the clock from buoys anchored at various points around the ocean. Five of these buoys are observing ice packs and icebergs coming into the Indian Ocean from Antarctica. Besides the buoys, data on cloud cover and wind and temperature change are received by satellite. Satellite images are also being used to record the size of the icebergs from the moment they break off from Antarctica. Their course is then mapped as they move out into the Southern Ocean. Here at the Institute, the raw data from the various sources are received and the information is then constantly processed by a bank of computers. Once the data have been collated, the next step in the process is the analysis by experts here and at centres around the world looking for even the slightest shift in patterns of temperature, wind and sea levels. In the light of the fact that this is a global enterprise, the Institute is staffed 24 hours a day with researchers working in shifts, and we are in constant contact with centres all around the world. In total, 900 experts from around the globe are involved in the programme. The work at the Institute is now into the fifth year of a 10-year data collection, which began in 2003. The analysis of the five years to 2008 will be published early in 2009. However, changes in patterns are already being noticed since the data have been gathered. That is the end of section 4. You now have half a minute to check your answers.